Saturday, good people. We are live and direct. We back again. Riot Starter TV. It's been a minute. It's been somewhat of a minute. Um, I haven't been on here in about uh, man. Uh, it's been some weeks. It's some weeks. Been um, a lot of things happening, and I wanted to start this Black August off properly. First and foremost, for folks who are not familiar, it is Black August, and this is my first uh, Riot Starter TV of Black August. And Black August is about political prisoners which uh, if you watch this platform, you already know that. Um, but uh, we are continuing that fight. We continue that play. It's the 43rd year commemoration of Black August. So many of us are fasting and training and studying and researching and doing the things that we need to do in order to get ourselves right and to continue to support our freedom fighters. Uh, folks who are unaware, yesterday we lost a uh, veteran Panther and former political prisoner who served 43 years in um, solitary confinement. Um, he did 44 years altogether. He was a um, was one of the Angola Three. And uh, the brother's name is uh, man, my brain is messing up right now. Brother Albert Woodfox. Brother Albert Woodfox. Um, like I said, you know, he's he's did 43 years in solitary confinement. He's the longest held political prisoners in solitary. Um, he got out about six years ago and three years ago, he wrote a book with the title solitary. And, um, you know, he will certainly be missed. You know, it, it, it is nothing short of criminal for an individual to do that much time, especially when it's uh, when the charges are false. Uh, that that makes it even worse. But 43 years in solitary is not just 43 years in prison. We're talking about a whole nother monster. Um, I want to also point out there's a number of things going on this month, along with the fasting and the studying and whatnot. Um, there are a few different events. We want to remind fo folks, though, that Black August is not a uh, celebration. It's a commemoration and it's a month of resistance. And when we say Black August resistance, the response is long live the dragon. It's a lot of, uh, like I said, events. Uh, we have um, on the 21st, we'll be paying honor and having a tribute for one of my OGs, OG Shaka Thinen, who made his transition uh, this past April. Many of you know that he is one of the founders of Black August, of the Black August Organizing Committee. Um, he's a comrade. Uh, Phil Marshall George Jackson. And aside from that, he was the uh, chairman of the Black August Organizing Committee for quite some while time. In fact, I served as East Coast chair of Black August Organizing Committee under his uh, under his uh, leadership. You know, so on the 21st in Oakland, we will be commemorating his life. And on the 27th and 28th in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Black August continues with the Happily Natural Fest and also the Black August 5K run. For more information on Black August, you can go to thepeoplesarmy.org slash Black August, thepeoplesarmy.org slash Black August. Now, in the tradition of state violence, um, there was a report issued uh, maybe about a week or so ago um, in, in regards to the um, number of brothers and sisters and people in general who have been murdered by police this year. So far, the number uh, as of the end of July was 703, which means that there's been on average 100 murders uh, by police per month this year, which is, uh, to my understanding, this is the highest number on record thus far for this time of the year. Uh, I wanted to reach out to someone who knew a little something about that. In fact, you know, we got that report from mapping violence, uh, mapping police violence. So I wanted to reach out to the founder of mapping police violence. He decided to come through and grace us with his presence. So I want to introduce our audience to Samuel Sinyagwe. What's happening, my man? How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Hey, man, we're live on arrival. For uh, folks who are unaware of who you are, can you give us a, a, a breakdown of, um, you know, how did you get involved in this fight against police terrorism and how did you get involved, involved in activism as a whole? 
Yeah, so um, my story really goes back to 2014 in the context of the Ferguson uprising. Um, now, you know, at that time, I was working at actually in Oakland at a racial justice organization um, doing research and data work, um, really focused on like school to prison pipeline issues. So, um, you know, black and brown, you know, kids getting pushed out of school. Um, and then Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson. I mean, you don't you don't need my retelling of it. I mean, we, we all lived through this. This was, um, you know, we've seen the largest protests in our nation's history since then. Um, but, you know, you recall back in those early days and weeks and months of this national uh, conversation and movement around stopping police violence, um, there was very little information that was being provided from the government, um, the media, anyone to really help us understand the full scale and scope of police violence in this country. So, you know, the federal government could tell you how much rainfall there was uh, in rural Oklahoma going back 100 years. They can't tell you how many people were killed by the police last year or this year. Um, so, and it's not because they don't have the capacity to collect that data, it's because they don't have the willingness uh, to collect that data or to make it transparent. Um, so in that context, seeing those early reports um, that there was not data being provided by the government on this issue, that the number of people killed by police was not known, um, you know, as a data scientist, that was sort of, that was my calling to, to, to make a difference, to get involved. Um, in the way that I knew how, and that was to begin uh, collecting that information, um, compiling it into a database, um, building a website, we became Mapping Police Violence, um, and then publishing reports that can help track, um, you know, state-sponsored violence across the country. And, and since then, um, what, what that project uh, has been able to find, what we've been able to find is essentially that 1,100 people are killed by police each year, um, about three people every single day, uh, black people three times more likely to be killed than white people, more likely to be unarmed when killed by the police. Um, you can track particular states, particular cities that have extremely high rates of police violence compared to others. Um, so all of this uh, knowledge, all this research um, really traces back to that that initial uprising, which really, uh, I think, um, not only changed the national conversation, but made it clear um, that police violence was a crisis and that the government wasn't prepared to even tell us about it, let alone handle it. Now, when you say that the government wasn't prepared to tell us about it, do you think that was by design? I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm an activist, right? So um, or what you would call an activist, I've uh, been doing this since uh, around 1986, right? So I may look at the 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 question of policing slightly different just based off of you know, uh, from a historical context. So just, you know, I wanted to pose that question. Do you feel that they weren't prepared or they weren't interested? So I think that it is mostly that they weren't interested. Um, and maybe I'll even clarify that. I think that they were interested, but they were interested in that information not being made public. Um, and I say that because, you know, now we've, I mean, it's been seven or eight years since since Ferguson the initial uprising. And, you know, in that in that time, the government has had ample time, ample resources, ample capacity um, to build a comprehensive database of people who are killed by the police, let alone all of these other forms of police violence that even happen even more frequently and are less likely to be reported in the media. Um, and they have failed to do that. They even admitted, I mean, at the end of, of last year, they put out a report um, saying that they might have to shut down the federal government's use of force data collection program because uh, not en not enough uh, police departments were reporting data to the program. They didn't feel like they had enough information. Uh, it wasn't reliable or comprehensive enough to make public in their in their view. Um, so they've just decided not to make anything public, not to share even the information they have. Um, and they admitted that that information is woefully um, you know undercounting the number of people who are actually impacted. Um, so meanwhile, you know, with with no resources, um, you know, my team and I have built a database that is far more comprehensive than what the government has done. Um, and not only that, but then, I, you know, it, it comes out and this happened under the Trump administration, but is, is still in place today, um, to my knowledge, that the FBI essentially adopted an internal rule um, that they were not going to share any information uh, that would be helpful to organizers or activists to understand how many people the police were killing in their cities or in the state. Um, they weren't going to share any of that detailed information until 80% of the nation's law enforcement participates in the program. 
Um, currently, it's about 60%, and there is no, it's been hovering at about you know, 50, 60%, I mean, for years. So uh, it's unlikely that it'll ever get to 80%. And so they basically said they're not going to share any information, even that they do receive under the program that exists. So okay. that's that's the landscape. They don't have a. They have some data. It's not complete. It's not uh, rely, not completely reliable. Not comprehensive. Um, and they're not going to release even that. Um, so basically, you know, it is up to organizers, researchers, activists outside of the government um, finding this information from local media reports, from public records requests, um, and putting all this together in a way um, that can tell a story that the government doesn't want us to tell. Okay. So now. You, you, you mentioned, you know, you're a data scientist, right? And you said, uh, and in your bio says you're a uh, policy analyst, correct? Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, because you mentioned uh, Ferguson, uh, the whole Mike Brown situation. Many of us were out there and we saw the conundrum unfold in real time, right? So what about Ferguson? What about Mike Brown sparked your interest in the whole data collection uh side of it because i mean first of all let me say that it, it is honorable because you know there's no neutrals in war and and we all have a role to play and um one of the things we talk about is we take uh uh petty bourgeois skills and we make them work in the interest of the people right that is your duty your duty is to whatever you learn um however you advance it's not the advancement as the first black you know, astronaut or the first black Martian, it is about you saying, okay, boom, I'm standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, literally. Um, and, you know, I, I have to take my skill set. Before you answer that, I want to go back, like what, you know, give us some educational background. How did you become a um, a, a da data scientist or any uh, a policy analyst? And then I want to know, how did you decide to bring that skill to the battle? Yeah, so um, so if we go, we're going all the way back. Um, for me, I, I, you know, originally I really wanted to be an astrophysicist. That's what I wanted to be. Hmm. Uh, you know, I was a little kid. I would study, you know, the stars and the planets and the distance between the planets and the speed at which they orbit uh, around their given star and you know what, how many light years away the nearest black hole was. I mean, I was all up into that reading Stephen Hawking, etc. Sure. Uh, but you know, I, I really didn't have the luxury of, you know, thinking about planets and, you know, theoretical physics, because the issues that were right up in my face were a lot more relevant and personal and, and direct to me. And that was uh, the issue of racism, um, the issue of structural inequality. Um, I mean, these were things that, you know, like, I mean, I would be one of these, these black boys in school that would, the teacher would try to push out, right? Like I would get suspended, um, always called out for things that like I wasn't even doing. Um, you know, they would try to push me out of what were predominantly white schools, right, in the South, in in, uh, in Florida. Um, and so growing up in that system, right, I was, there was a sense of injustice that I felt in how I was treated and how people who looked like me were treated and how uh, communities um, that looked like me were being treated. Um, that much was apparent, right? Like that wasn't, uh, it wasn't that Mike Brown, like, taught me that injustice was real. Um, it was right. more so that I, I had felt like like these were issues. I knew that these were issues, but needed a, a language and a set of skills that could really help me address them, um, that could give me the ability to move policymakers and researchers and people in positions of power and privilege um, in ways that could help our people, that could move them, that could dismantle some of the arguments they were using to oppress us. Um, so really, I got I started out, you know, I, I mentioned I worked in, in Oakland. I was working at a nonprofit focused on educational inequity, so working on school to prison pipeline issues, um, working with uh, community organizations and school administrators um, to remove police from schools, um, to end policies that allowed students to be suspended for willful defiance and all these things that they used to suspend black black boys and girls. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was already focused on on inequity, focus on racial justice, but doing that in the space of education um, up until Mike Brown was was murdered by the police. Um, and when that happened, and especially, you know, my, my initial focus, right, you know, seeing those reports, seeing the protests, um, and then seeing the fact that the government wasn't providing any real data on the subject. 
So there'd be article after article that would come out that would just say, how many people are killed by the police? We don't know. The government doesn't have data. And that's it. That's like where the story would end. So on the one hand, you had policymakers, researchers, people in the media, people, predominantly white people with a lot of power who are basically saying, we don't know whether this is an issue or not. We need to see data before we can make up our minds as to whether uh, it's, a, it's a problem that black people keep being murdered by the police. That was there. That was really what they were saying. So they needed um, data. They haven't heard of right, uh, slavery right. or any of that type of stuff. But right. Like they needed data to know that this wasn't a series of what they call isolated incidents involving bad apple officers, that if you would just remove that one officer or charge this one officer in this one case, that the system as a whole would be sound. That was like, the like right. that's the narrative they were pushing. Right. And right. you need data to combat that narrative. You need data to be like, no, this is systemic. This is happening. This isn't just one, two, three cases. This is 1,100 people being killed by police a year. Um, this isn't just you know a case that just happened to be a black person getting killed by the police. It turns out black people are three times more likely to be killed by police. And in this city that we're talking about, you know, we, at the time it was Baltimore with Freddie Gray, um, or we're talking about Cleveland with Tamir Rice. Every single person killed by the police on record in those cities at the time was black. So right. we had that data. Right. That data was available. I was able to collect that data, find those reports, compile it, tell a story about something that was happening that was systemic, that was a pattern that was happening all across this country um, that was disproportionately harming black people in particular. Um, and that's what the data was was useful for. That was what it had the power to help do. Um, and that's why I, you know, I, I decided to get into into this work, because one, um, yes, it matters life or death, like, like the, these issues. Um, are, are deeply personal and they, and they, and they matter for us. Um, and this space was one in which there was very little data um, that could that was a, being made available at that time um, to move that conversation forward and to move past some of those hurdles and roadblocks and narratives um, that, that people in power and privilege throw up to, to prevent us from making progress. So that's like why, why that's what Ferguson sparked for me um, was not only the realization um, you know, not only like seeing police violence um, and the problem of police violence, but also seeing the fact that the government wasn't doing its job to even track it, to even um, help us with basic information um, that can inform solutions. Now, um, and, and I'm glad that, uh, um, you know, that you brought that out. Uh, I wanted to, okay, so basically for, for the audience, what uh, Samuel's saying right here, right now, we're talking about, and I've seen data um, that that had even, you know, upward to fourteen hundred people murdered uh, by police um, in a given year. But with what he's saying right now, we're talking about at least a minimum of eleven thousand people murdered every ten years. Is that right, Samuel? Every year, and and yet, yeah, I mean, no, no, I'm saying eleven thousand every ten uh, years. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. So right. since 2013, it's been almost 11,000 people who've been killed. So it's, it's been about a decade. Um, yeah. So about 1,100 a, a year that we can track, right? And so this is right. important because this, to what you're saying around the 1,400, um, I mean, it's it's more than than 1,100 people who are killed by the police. Um, right. We can we're track 1,100 people are killed by police because it's reported in the media or to some other publicly available database. But where those cases are swept under the rug, where the media doesn't report it in cases that may be in more rural areas, areas where they don't have um, uh, like uh, witnesses or observers. I mean, those cases may may still go unreported today. Right. So, uh, and, and I and I I, I um, reiterated those those numbers because of the fact that you know I'm in Atlanta right now, and uh, College Park, Georgia, is about fourteen thousand as far as population. So, in essence, we're talking about. Uh, with police murders every 10 years, they're, they're literally taking out full towns, taking out cities. If if all of these people were, you know, in one city, we're talking about an entire city would be. So this is how real it is. You know, so it's not just, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, just abstract numbers, because I think that oftentimes those numbers don't mean anything until you are involved personally, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, it's deeply, it's deeply, um, you know, in terms of making this, this, this data like real for people. Um, I mean, one in every three people killed by a stranger in this country is killed by a police officer. One in every three. So if, you know, there's been all of this conversation about, um, 
you know, mass shootings, for example, which, which are a huge problem. And there's this, I, there's a fear, right? A real fear, palpable fear that, you know, you'll just be in a mall, some stranger will come in with an AR-15 and, and, and you could die, right? Or, you know, you'll be at home, somebody could break into your house, you don't know, um, and kill you. Or there could be a, a school shooting or something. Like that, that, these are like real things, real fears that we have. But when we look at the data, like one in every three cases where somebody is killed by a stranger in this country, the person that they are killed by is a police officer, right? So they are making up a large share of actually like what this fear is, is really about in large part is, 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 is being perpetrated by the police. Right. Um, and in some cities, you actually have rates of uh, killings by the police, police murders that are higher than the U.S. murder rate. So right. we talk about murder rates, especially now there's been a conversation about crime and murder rates, like the U.S. murder rate, even today, like the national U.S. murder rate, your likelihood of being getting killed by anyone, civilian or police, um, is lower than if you are a black man living in St. Louis today. If you are mm -hmm. a black man living in St. Louis, you're more likely to be killed by a police officer than the average American is to be killed by anyone, civilian or police. Like the rate is higher than the U.S. murder rate. So like it, in some places, in some communities that have extremely high rates of police violence, um, it is like the numbers are really are off the charts. It impacts a huge proportion of the population. Um, and not only those individuals who are harmed, but family members, community members. I mean, there's research now, like researchers have taken the data that, that we collect at Mapping Police Violence um, and done research that has shown that when a black person is killed by police in a given state, the black population of the entire state has worse mental health, they report worse mental health outcomes than in, in, in when, when a black person is not killed by police. So that what that means is these incidents of police murder are traumatizing our entire communities. They're negative, like you can trace and track the negative impact on our mental health as a, as a population, like as a community because of these, of these incidents of police murder. So it is, it is widespread. The impact is beyond even the 1,100, 1,400 people who are killed. Like there are another host of people, 55,000 people a year who are estimated to be injured by police but survive. And then beyond that, there are family members, community members who are, who are impacted. And would you say there are a number of cases that go unreported that you can't track? Exactly. There are a number of cases that go unreported, in particular in uh, more rural areas, um, areas where there's less likely to have a like established local media organization that would report on it or you'd have bystanders or somebody who would you know uh, photograph it or film it or something um, in those in those areas it's it's most likely to to be underreported mm -hmm. so now with, with these track this tracking uh system that you all have is it strictly um uh civilians who are in general population and not inmates or is it do, does, does the inmate system the prison system count as well or how do you all work that so, uh, so it doesn't include people who are killed after they've already been booked into jail or into prison you said um, it doesn't so it doesn't include that okay. so okay there there are there there's actually um for prisons there's slightly better data collection around this um in part because each state manages it and they're you know 50 state systems for policing, there's like 18,000 different police departments. So they all have their own different systems and tracking like that's unwieldy in a way that for prisons with 50 different systems, it's still unwieldy, but a little bit easier to manage in terms of tracking. Um, but jails is all over the place. Each county, you know, they have their own jail. There's thousands right. of jails. Um, the Huffington Post tried, there was an effort um, a couple of years ago um, by the Huffington Post to try to track how many people died in jails. Um, they came to between eight and 900 people that they could find information on in a given year. Wow. Uh, so, so it's, you know, it's about a similar number to the number of people killed by the police. Now that, that, that's very important. Um, close to, <laughs> so you, you may escape what's going on in the streets, but you're still not out the, uh, out of, uh, the box once you're, once you're, uh, quote unquote, in the box once you're incarcerated, right? Um, I want to give the audience, the viewers, um, um, an idea of the type of people who are murdered by police. Because again, like you said, you know, organizing for so many years, you know, we've heard all the, uh, the, the stories and the, the quote unquote 
solutions, which are not really solutions. Um, you know, uh, just pull your pants up, uh, just go to school and, you know, uh, you, you, you shouldn't have been doing anything. Um, here in Atlanta, I remember being on a panel with some clowns from uh, uh, the uh, Citizen Review Board. And they put up, they spent $30,000 on billboards. And those billboards said, uh, don't run. That was the solution that the, the, the citizen, that the, the uh, police review board, citizen review board here in, uh, uh, I mean, civilian review board in Atlanta had. They said, you know, you spent all this money in these billboards. They said, just don't run and the police won't shoot you. Is that true? I mean, what what is what has been the case here? Um, you know, is it uh, are the majority of the people you find are they are they armed? Are they engaging police? Are they attacking the police? What's going on? Playing crackers advocate here. So, um, so you know, one of the things with with this work, just like I mean, it, it don't even matter what field you're in. Like, there is racism, white supremacy is going to show up, and it there are going to be narratives that that operationalize that white supremacy. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean um, in policing, right? Um, and not even not even just policing. Let's let's even go to um, another another related issue, which is um, gun safety, right? So, gun safety. We've been talking about mass shootings, school shootings, etc. Uh, there's a narrative, right? There's a narrative that really prevents any type of sustained progress from happening. Um, and that narrative is something is the good guy with the gun narrative, right? Is a narrative that like the way to stop a, sh a shooter, a mass shooter, um, or mass shootings in general is we need more people with more powerful guns so that they hopefully are just on the scene there already and they can stop that shooter. That's like the, the narrative, right? So if we just have more guns in society, people will be safer. The good guy with the gun, more good guys with the gun. That's like the narrative. Now, like all the research shows that's wrong, right? Like, all the research is like more guns, more guns with more powerful weaponry, like more powerful capacity, you know, high capacity magazines, et cetera, means more deaths, right? That's what the research shows. But like, despite that, like the narrative has its own power. The narrative of the good guy with the gun literally has had the power to, to convince a whole lot of people that there was that not to embark on any type of restriction on guns um, and a whole lot of, and it's blocked legislation from happening, right? Now, that's like that space. Now let's look at policing. There's another set of narratives. Um, equally as wrong, right? Like the data doesn't support them, but equally as powerful. Um, and the narrative for policing goes something like this, right? That police are using so much force, even deadly force, especially in black and brown communities because they are encountering violent individuals and violent in violent neighborhoods and having to defend themselves or other people from harm. That's the narrative. That is like the white supremacist script. Right. Like, like some version of that. You turn on Fox News, it'll be that script. Like it's been that script from the start. They tried yeah, to be, yeah. they tried to do the whole like, you know, there's actually no disparity at all. Like the police are not more likely to to, to do anything in black and brown communities. Then like they like even that was untenable. Like that is like the so obviously wrong. They had to adjust it a little bit to say, okay, police are actually shooting more black and brown people, but but it's because they're encountering more of a threat. That's like the narrative, right? Hmm. Um, I hear this all the time. Police chiefs still say this, policymakers, conservatives, like this is this is what they believe. Now, what does the data actually say, right? Like what is the actual truth? The actual truth is this. The truth is that the majority of cases in which people are killed by the police start from either a tra a tra somebody who was stopped for a, a low level traffic violation, so regular traffic violation, a mental health crisis, which isn't even a crime, hmm. a low-level nonviolent offense, or a nonviolent disturbance. That's it. Those I, are. The I, I want you. To, I want you to repeat. You know, yeah. even though folks can rewind, I want yeah. you to repeat what you just said because it, it is. I mean, it is so insane that that I need you to please. Yeah. So. Um, 1,100 people that we track killed by the police a year, the majority of those people, the majority of people killed by police are killed after being stopped for either a traffic violation, it's a regular traffic violation, a mental health crisis, which is not even a crime, a low-level nonviolent offense, so this is things like drug possession, 
um, sex work, loitering, trespassing, things that are often associated with homelessness, poverty, substance use, people who need help, um, or a nonviolent disturbance. So somebody is like at home having an argument and they call in the police, but nonviolent disturbance. Um, or, and then the last category is cases where there was no crime or offense even alleged by the police. They just mm -hmm. saw somebody and decided to just stop them without the even dangerous. Them. Right. Right. Those are, the, those are the categories. You take all those categories, add them together, you've got um, the majority of people who are killed by police. Meanwhile, right, you have this violence narrative, right? The violent crime, whatever. Fewer than one in three people in any given year, I mean, we've tracked this all the way back, fewer than one in three people who were killed by the police were stopped by the police for an alleged violent crime. Alleged, not even like convicted, alleged violent crime. Right. Right. So that's what's going on. What's going on is, a whole lot of people are getting stopped for low-level, nonviolent issues, some things that aren't even crimes, and ending up losing their lives, um, ending up being killed by agents of the state um, right. in the end. So that's that's what's happening. Um, when we look at you know the the demographics, for example, um, that is true. You know, the, for black people who are killed by the police, is true for white people who are killed by the police. Like that is across the board, majority for these low-level issues. Um, we know that black people are more likely to be unarmed when killed by the police, less likely to even be alleged to have presented any type of threat or, or anything that the police can claim. Um, so, you know, this is actually more likely to be uh, running away. So either running away or um, driving away when killed by the police. So like they were not even coming towards the police. They were trying to get away and the police still killed them uh, right. about a third of cases. So, yeah. so again, like this is, that's what, that's what's actually happening. Um, and part of the data, like collecting this data, the, like a big reason for having this data is so that we can actually push back against some of these narratives that, I mean, have been around since slavery, right? Like it's right. been this, this you know, stereotype of black criminality and, and all of this blaming communities for their own deaths. And, and so we data can be a tool to push back against that to dis, to dismantle and debunk some of those narratives um and to move us to a place where we can have real conversations about solutions that aren't just like dragged down by false narratives and white supremacy well i'm definitely glad you all are on the case when it comes to this data because you know again you know organizing um pre-social media right i can recall you know again the, the whole you know well, what were they doing? And, and, you know, the police aren't just gonna, you know, shoot someone for no reason. They're not gonna beat anyone for any reason. And literally it probably wasn't up to, um, 1992, uh, with the whole Rodney King situation where folks got to see, you know, the police at work, you know what I mean? Um, I want to point out as well, just to your point about, uh, the whole unarmed and mental crisis situation here in, Georgia in, a, in in Decatur, which is right outside of Atlanta, if you know this area. Um, in 2019, a 27 year old uh, former veteran, uh, a 27 year old veteran, I'm sorry, uh, was shot and killed because he was shot twice center mass by an officer that felt threatened. Now, the problem with this particular situation, the young man's name is Anthony Hill. The problem with Anthony Hill's murder and Robert Olson, the, the pig who gunned him down, the problem was that uh, Anthony Hill was totally naked. He had no clothes on at all. So you, it, it's clear that he was unarmed, you know, but the cop decided to say that he was coming at him and he felt threatened, you know, so he shot him twice center mass. Um, you know, so I, I wanted to, uh, you know, point that example out because oftentimes, you know, again, we follow the police narrative, even folks who are quote unquote activists. There's still folks who consider themselves activists and fighters and so on and so forth. And the first thing they're going to do is call the police. You know what I mean? Anything goes on. Or I got called 911. So it's really like a game of Russian roulette. I want to ask you, um, what are because we've had a number of different uprisings over the past several years. You mentioned Mike Brown, of course, the whole Freddie Gray situation. Uh, of course, uh, what went on with uh, 
a brother who was uh the knee to the neck it's, it's been so many people Floyd. Floyd. yes yes you know what, what's crazy samuel is you know i've been doing this shit so long and there's cases that i've worked on personally that i've actually forgotten about that's how much murder and terrorism is wreaked on the people by the these agents of the state so i wanted to know uh what are some of the things that uh you know that there's been these these empty quote unquote solutions right what do you feel is going to uh uh help to change this narrative do you have any uh solutions is it defund yeah. the police is it decentralize the police is it we shall overcome i mean what, what's your thoughts so um so i can tell you what what the what the data suggests um and and that is that so so let me let me sort of set set the uh the table for this so basically when we look at the research right we look at killings by police each year now i got data from 2013 all the way through the present you know you mentioned 703 people killed by police so far this year through july 31st when you look at that that range of data now almost a decade um, across the country um one of the things that you see is that from about 2014 through 2019 you see some shifts that are ha that happen real shifts that happen in policing that are concentrated in some of the largest cities in america now what do i mean i mean not like the uh like press releases and you know departments will say they did x and y like it, according to the actual numbers um there was a reduction in both fatal and non-fatal police shootings now it's starting to collect data on non-fatal police shootings as well um for those cities um of about 40 percent so 40 percent reduction in police shootings fatal and non-fatal um which you know is is there's a lot of work yet to be done but is is like a significant change um now there are a lot of researchers who were trying who've been investigating this trying to figure out like what what happened um there are a couple of things that we know the places that saw the largest reductions in police shootings were places that reduced low-level arrests the most so these arrests for low-level offenses that I, that as i said are responsible for you know these are the situations that make up a huge proportion of killings by the police cases where the police stop people for all these low-level non-violent issues that really don't i mean why are the police even intervening in the first place oftentimes it's just people who need help uh, people who might be homeless, people might um, be have substance use issues, mental health issues, you know, whatever. Um, those places that reduced arrest for low-level offenses the most saw the largest reductions in police shootings. Um, and by the way, did so without seeing any other, like any increase in crime or violent crime or murders relative to other places. So there's, there's a narrative that like if the police pull back and stop arresting people for low-level issues, suddenly crime rates are going to increase that's not what happened in this case. Can you give us a, uh, you know, not to, um, not to cut your, your, your thinking, but, uh, or your bill, can you give us some example of some of these cities or that you're speaking of? Yeah. I mean, these are the largest cities in the country, right? And, 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 you know, we're talking about overall numbers. Um, so if you look at, I mean, if you look at New York city, if you look at Chicago, if you look at LA, uh, up until recently, which I'm going to get into what happened in 2021 and now it's happening again, 2022. So you notice I stopped at 2019. Um, but some of the largest cities in the country, the 30 largest cities in the country, overall, 40% average reduction in police shootings. Um, that is, is largely driven by some of the, like Chicago, New York, LA, um, Dallas, uh, seen something like an 88% reduction in killings by the police since 2013. Um, big cities, right? These are also the cities that saw the largest reductions in low-level arrests. So you look at New York City. Um, legislators signed the Criminal Justice Reform Act, I believe in 2016, uh, which, which, decriminalized a number of um, low-level offenses that, that police in the NYPD was arresting a whole bunch of people for under broken windows policing. They decided to pull back from that. Um, you see a 76% reduction in low-level arrests in New York City um, since 2013. Um, so some of the largest cities in the country did start reducing arrests for low-level offenses um, up until 2019. Um, now, what else do you see in those places? They are also the places that have had the largest number of protests. Um, so there have been two or three studies that have now come out that have shown 
um, that the number of protests in a given place is a significant predictor of changes in killings by the police. So much so that places that had more protests had reductions in killings by the police relative to places that had fewer protests, controlling for other factors. So the places that made progress, places that reduced low-level arrests, reduced um, or that places that had a lot of protests and, and organizing and advocacy. Um, so what does that say? Well, I mean, it suggests that one, um, the protests have made a difference, um, at least up until about 2019 or so. Um, it also suggests that the calls to reduce the overall size and scope of the police state, to defund the police, to cut back on the number of officers on the force, to cut back on the amount of police funding, to cut back and decriminalize um, a whole host of things that the police are currently arresting people for, that those calls are consistent with reducing police shootings. Um, the places that were moving in that direction were making progress in reducing police shootings, but then 2020, 2021, and now 2022. Now we see a backlash. So essentially what you see is a break in the data ending in 2019, George Floyd's murder in 2020. Um, you see the largest protest in the nation's history. And then almost sure, immediately sure. thereafter, you see a backlash. You see a conversation around crime. You see some of these cities are now giving up on some of the progress that they've made. You see San Francisco you know, recalling Chessa. Um, you see in New York City with Eric Adams. Um, right. You see in so LA what's happening right now with the attempt to recall Gascon. So. I mean, these are real, there was actual progress. Like we, we say a lot, like nothing has changed, but like things were starting to change in some of the largest cities in the country where organizers were the most effective at, at pushing in the direction that organizers have been calling for, which is to defund the police. So in your in your opinion, the police state. Right, so in your opinion, uh, you know, you said up until 2019, 2020, right? What, um, why would they want to, uh, uh, to, to, to backpedal why, why why would you why would you think that what, so the reason that they're backpedaling um you know they they're they'll you look at the these politicians they're saying oh it's crime it's crime that somehow any effort to hold the police accountable will somehow you know lead to crime rates increasing or prevent the police from quote unquote keeping us safe even though we know that's not what they do um that's so do you like think, do you think it's a need and a desire for crime or to criminalize uh particular Africans in, in, in America? I mean, do you think that- yeah, it's, 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 We saw this before, like this is, um, I mean, we saw this in, in the 94 crime bill, 100,000 police officers. And I mean, this we've seen this, we've seen this, I mean, I don't know how many times, like I've been around right, for right. Like, a few cycles. I mean, I'm sure there've been, I don't even know how many cycles of this there have been, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the same push to say, if, if there's any increase in crime that somehow the police weren't being aggressive enough towards black people, that's the narrative. Okay. Like, that, that, that's um, what I mean that. yeah. So that's what they're reacting to. But again, like that is not what the data says. The data says that the places that actually moved in the direction that organizers were pushing for, reducing the size and, and, and sort of scope of the police state, those places actually saw less of an increase in crime. So, so murder rates increased across the country, like almost unanimously over the past uh, year or two. But they increase more in the places that double down on the aggressive policing tactics of arresting more people for low-level offenses than they increase in the places that actually reduce those arrests. So it turns out that the places that actually double down on that aggressive policing strategy ended up seeing higher crime rates in the end. So, you know, that's not, it doesn't make any sense to move in that direction. And it will uh, re, uh, repeal or reverse some of the progress that had been made that had been made in some of those cities. Um, and, and we see that LA has, is back at record police shootings levels. Um, New York is, is going back up. Chicago is going back up. So a lot of these cities that did see those reductions over, you know, since the Ferguson uprising really um, so are starting to see those, those gains reversed. Do, do you, um, would you say you have faith in this system changing this dynamic around or, or, I mean, how do, how do you think this is going to happen? Do you think it's a, a people thing? Do you think it's uh, about voting? Do you think that, you know, um, you know, there's some, you know, like you said, a few bad apples? What What's your take on that? Because, you know, mapping police violence is definitely an important tool used by um, hundreds and, and I would say thousands of activists. You know, so, you know, I really want to 
dig into your your brain and like okay because I, I see that you're saying that there's been uh there's been changes and of course your your data your numbers guy right um and you know again perhaps because you know i'm, I'm in the the field of the shield and the spear i don't always see those 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 numbers as far as changing because you know at the same time you're telling me that it's it's been consistent that it's been at least 1100 murders by police so i'm trying to like figure this out and like you know work so with me here the, help me stay here here's, man. The, here's the um here's how those two things make sense so um while police shootings were reducing in the largest cities in the country um they were increasing everywhere else um not only that but you see so again we talk about backlash in the cities but that backlash is just the same sentiment that was already in the rural areas and suburban areas and the conservative areas from the start. Um, it's just made it to the cities now again. So, you know, it's, you know, in rural areas, this whole conversation, they've been doubling down. They've been passing laws that criminalize protesters, passing laws that increase penalties on, on, on uh, criminal penalties on people for low level offenses, passing laws that make it more difficult to hold the police accountable. Like that's what's been happening in rural America. That's what's been happening everywhere outside of some of the largest cities. So police violence has continued to accelerate there. So it reduced a little bit in, in the largest cities that actually began to, to move in the direction that organizers were pushing them, was increasing everywhere else, which basically was a wash, it offset. That's why it's 1,100 every single year. Um, but now we're seeing it actually tick up a little bit. So this year has been more um, in the first seven months of this year, more people were killed by police than any other year on record. And a part of that has to do with the fact that we know we're no longer seeing those reductions in big cities. Um, we're seeing the increase that was happening in rural and suburban areas is continuing. And now we're seeing an increase in cities too. So across the board, we're going to see the numbers go up. So that's sort of what, what is happening sort of below the surface. Um, and, and part of that, the story that's so important is that it is not a story of there's nothing we can do. We've we've done, you know, we've had the largest protests in history, and yet still nothing is changing. That's not the whole story. The story is one of which protests were starting to actually move the numbers, move outcomes, save lives in real ways, in real places. Um, and now that progress is being undermined, is being reversed, um, and the police are doubling down on on uh, their failed strategies everywhere. So what do you think about, uh, you know, one of the things we were calling for decentralizing the police, right? What do you think about, uh, uh, for example, a residency clause? Do you think that would help if if the police actually lived in the community that they served? Um, so there's been some some research on this. Um, there was an analysis in 538 that looked at the demographics of police departments. Um, they found that the demographics in places that had a residency clause were not like different than the ones that didn't. So basically, if you have a residency clause, what ends up happening is they just hire the white people in that city instead of the black people in that city. Mm -hmm. So even if you're limited to only hiring from the city or only hiring in particular areas, like they still work around those those rules to create, you know, a disproportionately white police force. Um, so so re I don't I don't think residency would make a difference in terms of the demographics, but might make a difference like economically. Right. Well, now, I'm not I, talking about in the city. I'm talking about actually because I get that. Uh, I mean, literally living in the community that you serve, literally living in the neighborhood that you're serving. Do you think that would make a difference if we're going, let's say, your your officer Sam and and you know my son and your son goes to school together. Uh, we go to the same church together. We go to the same supermarkets. Do you think that would make a difference, or do you think that's just? So, you know, um. I haven't seen any research that's shown that it would reduce police use of force, police violence, the deadly use of force, racial disparities in policing. I haven't seen any. There's, I mean, there have been investigations, that, like there have been research studies, like none of them have found that that would really like increase the likelihood that people's lives would be saved. But what it would do that is problematic is just put a whole bunch of police officers in black and brown neighborhoods who aren't already living there. So like that, I, that doesn't sound like progress either because you don't want a neighborhood that's just saturated with police even more so than it is already right pig city um so um and to the other question i asked in regards to do you have faith that you know in this system that this system can be reformed um you know no um 
Like, well, so and, and what must be done? No, because um, you know. Yeah, I think reforms. No, I think that um, I have faith that we can create better alternatives. I think some of those are already being piloted in some cities where you have mental health clinicians now who are responding to mental health crises instead of the police. Um, so I think I have faith that we can build a way better way of responding to people who are calling whatever number it is that they're going to call, if it's 911 or what have you. Um, now you got 988. So whatever number it is, I think we can build a way better response. I think that that response um, will not involve armed police officers. Like, I don't think that there should be armed police officers responding to all of these things that now people are losing their lives for. Again, the vast majority are low-level nonviolent issues. Um, and I think that to get there, right, like there is, like we're going to need data that is uh, able to, to make the case for those changes. So we need data on those alternatives now. Like we need to have the proof that those alternatives are effective, that they're responding, that they're not calling the police in for backup, that they're more cost effective. Like Denver, you know, they have the STAR program. They're starting to do that. Um, they produce some of that data now, and that's what it shows, right? They, they never call the police for backup, and um, it's more cost effective in responding to mental health calls than the police. Um, so we're going to need more of that. We're going to need now, I think the next phase of this is to build out an evidence base around what actually works around the alternative responses um, so that ultimately that data can be useful in replacing the current system. Cool. Let, let me, um, uh, so mapping police violence, you know, is this a nonprofit? How is it funded? I mean, you know, yes. you know so we're this, a this, 501c3 nonprofit organization, mapping police violence. Um, our website's mappingpoliceviolence.us. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah, so we, we are a, a small organization um, and most of our work is actually like funded through like individual donations. So like from the, from the start, like this, the Mapping Police Violence Project really, like I founded in 2015 um, in the context of the Ferguson uprising and, and, and all of that. And um, it's never been like a, a project that has been like, well funded. We've, it's been individual donations and like off the shelf solutions. So I've got like a started with a free trial version of Tableau to do like the charts, a free trial version of Carto to build the map, free trial version of Squarespace to build a website. Now it's like a twenty dollar a month subscription. Um, so like it's not a heavily resourced organization, but we do what we can with what we got. So it's it's only dot us, correct? Because I have uh, because That's I got right. I got so a couple Mapping different calls. Dot US is the uh, most up to date and and okay. accurate. Uh, database. There is a .org. It used to be at the .org. It's not currently. Um, so that's sort of fallen out of date, but the, okay. you can get all the information at mappingpolicepolice.us. And I'm glad you said it because there were a few different people that caused like the site isn't even, isn't even updated. So um, it's .us for the folks who yeah. don't know mappingpoliceviolence.us. I wish it was updated at the .org. You know, I mean, this is um, not, not, it wasn't my decision. And certainly, you know, our organization is, is trying to, um, you know, Uh, Samuel looks like he's having some technical difficulties. You still there? Um, we can see your uh, piece for some reason. You're not uh, not seeing you on the screen. Anyway, um, we're live. You know, for folks who are asking in the chat, yes, we are live. This is Riot Starter TV. We're live with Samuel Sinyangwe, uh, who is uh, founder of um, Mapping Police Violence and also... Um, He's the founder of uh, uh, Police Scoreboard and um, amongst other things. Um, definitely you can put your questions in the chat for folks they want to ask. It is Black August. Black August resistance continues. And we want you all to make sure that you uh, stay on top of things. For folks who are unfamiliar with Black August at this point, go to thepeoplesarmy.org slash Black August. Thepeoplesarmy.org slash black august to find out what's going on and how we getting down uh hopefully uh sam will come back on and uh chat with us we lost them um so hopefully that's not uh you know that, that is short term how's everybody doing man everybody all right out there anybody feeling what we're doing here uh we have some real heavy shows coming up this month uh let's just say that we're starting off with samuel but uh in um at the end of the month we will have uh closing out dr joy james and we'll be talking about uh everything from black august to uh 
the Attica Rebellion. I want to bring you all more, more, and some more, you know what I mean, of uh, of this flavor. We have a whole lot of good people that we look forward to interviewing, and we think it's necessary to continue to uh, hit us, hitting folk, hit folks with uh, with, with that food that we need. Anyway, uh, we found my man Sam. He's back again, and I'm gonna bring him back on. Hey, how's it going? My bad, my uh, computer died. I had to get my charger. But okay. um, oh, yeah, I was saying, go to mapofpoliceviolence.us. You can get um, all the data that you need. And uh, yeah, I mean, looking forward to. If you want to reach out, my my email is samsway s a m s w e y, and then the number one at gmail.com. Like okay. happy, we happy to work with anybody and can certainly give you data relevant to like a given city or state or whatever would be helpful for your organizing. No doubt. I, you you have another piece called uh, Police Scorecard. Can you tell yep. us about the Police Scorecard? Yeah. So um, so mapping police violence is a database of people who've been killed by the police. Um, police Scorecard is essentially a database of everything else. Um, so um, while, you know, police killings is, is often like the most like extreme and urgent issue. Like there are so many other things that the police are doing every day that impacts communities, um, that harms people, et cetera. And so um, trying to figure out how do we build out the ability to track all of these other outcomes across the country as well, um, so that we can actually use that, that data um, to make progress. So for example, if you go to policescorecard.org, currently we've got data for 16,000 of the nation's 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Um, so really decentralized policing's 18,000 police departments, but we've got data for most of them. Um, and so you can look up your city or your county and get a whole host of additional information. So you can get information on non-fatal police use of force. Um, so how many total use of force incidents, um, even those that, that were non-fatal, um, how many police misconduct complaints were reported and were, you know, how often were officers held accountable as a result? Um, you know, what's the police budget size and has that been going up or down? Um, it's probably been going up because it's been going up all across the country. It's police um, state, right. So, so all of that information, right, is, is, is in the police scorecard. Um, and the goal of that project really is to take all of those different metrics and put them together in, in essentially in a way that tracks progress towards ab abolition. Like that's like the, like low key, that's like the design of, of, of what, what the project's trying to do. So a city will get a higher score if, if it, spends less money on the police, so there's less police funding, fewer officers, um, less use of force, fewer disparate, racial disparities in, in who's impacted, um, all of those things, right? It's more, if you come forward and, and report officer, they're more likely to be held accountable. Um, so essentially trying to design a, a, a system that will value the things um, that actually help and benefit communities rather than the current system, which you know, essentially officers have quotas. I mean, their value for how many arrests they make, how many people they put in jail, how many people they harm rather than help. Uh, and so that's, the scorecard is creating a new model. No doubt. What's your thoughts on abolition, abolishing policing as we know it? I agree. I'm I, So I'm an abolitionist. I think that, you know, as a, as a data scientist and abolitionist, I think like, just as we've been really rigorous in trying to collect data on what the police are doing, figure out like how to make improvements and, and change those outcomes, I think we also need to be rigorous in evaluating the alternatives, right? So um, so I think that's the, the space that that a lot of the work will, where a lot of the work in the future will need to be done. Um, because what we can't do is like replace a existing violent system with another system that also is just per pervaded with white supremacy and and other problematic aspects, right? So it can't be that you know we're creating a, a mental health alternative but all the mental health clinicians are white um, right. or they like look like police officers they just like don't formally have police on the on the they don't have a gun right 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 or right. sometimes like they even you know they might have like a something other than a gun but it's it's also causing harm right or they might right. call the police for backup so like they're we got to think about how are we using data in creative and useful ways to improve our ability to imagine alternatives and to implement and operationalize those alternatives um so that's like that's like the abolitionist work that i'm most excited about no doubt man we definitely uh appreciate you coming on uh i want to if you got a few minutes uh open the floor up for a few questions sure. from the audience um any questions you can put them in the chat uh we're talking to samuel Senyingu, Yang. pronounce your name brother i'm sorry 
Sinyangwe. Okay, I, I had it right the first time. I'm just jacking it all the way up. But anyway, um, shout out to Samuel Sinyangwe for coming on and joining us. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. We got a few more minutes before we uh, lock out. While while these folks are deciding what questions they have, I wanted to ask you, uh, we talked about abolition. What would an abolished police state look like to you? What would an abolished, uh, abolished policing look like to you? Great question. Um, so I think... I think that there are a set of principles that would inform it um, in terms of like what it actually looks like. I think that'll depend by city, by state, by like how communities design it. But I think there are a set of principles. I think the principles should be um, that like number one, that that system is constructed in a way that it is, it is rigorously like set up and evaluated and is done with an explicit eye towards racial justice. Um, so like the current system is one in which like, not only is there no data, like, like the very little data that they're providing and making available, um, but like they're doing so in a way that is like by design, the system is by design reproducing inequitable outcomes. Um, and when you track it, you can, you can see that at every level, but even, but they don't even design it in a way that it's easy to track. So it's both inequitable and hard to prove that it's inequitable because of that, which is like the worst case scenario. Um, I think this other system should be proving to us that it is equitable, right? It should be the reverse of that. It should be a system where we're able to see, right? Like I can pull up a, a, a chart and see for my city, if I'm living in, let's say Denver, I should be able to know um, this alternative, if I call, you know, a number for, for a mental health crisis that's not the police. Like I should be able to know how well that response is. Like how quickly do they come? Do they actually meet my needs or do I still have the same issues? Did they invite the police for like to call the police for backup or did they otherwise do police like things like commit me to a asylum or arrest me anyway or detain me in some way or use some type of force? Um, so I think like the the abolitionist future that, that I'm envisioning is one in which like we're no longer having to do all the work of having to get all this information just to like figure out whether people are being treated right. Um, and I think like the system should be demonstrating every single day that it's treating people right, both in the numbers and in people's lived experiences interacting with that system. Um, so, so like from a data perspective, that's what I hope like the abolitionist future looks like. Um, I think there are a lot of like bigger philosophical questions and like other questions as well. Like, um that that we could talk all day about word word um yes to uh tay c yes our organization itself we we have definitely utilized uh, uh data from um from uh mapping police violence uh to educate the masses so you know that that is a yes to that question um we have another question uh from john keister can you compare the scores of police departments versus sheriff departments? So uh, currently the way that the police scorecard is set up um, is designed to create a standardized way of assessing like what the police are doing. Um, and when I say standardized, I mean, there are many different types of law enforcement agencies and they don't all do the same thing. So for example, like the sheriff's department tends to have jurisdiction over the jails. So there are a whole host of like indicators and metrics about jail incarceration that are relevant for the sheriffs, but might not be relevant for the local police department that doesn't operate the jails. Um, so in the scorecard, sheriffs are, value, are, are assessed compared to one another and police departments are compared to one another, but police are not compared to sheriffs because they have different, slightly different jurisdictions. Um, sheriffs also like have, they tend to be doing a lot of the, the more rural like policing, whereas police departments tend to be in more concentrated like cities. Um, so the way the scorecard set up, basically police departments are compared to police departments of similar size. So big cities compared to other big city police departments, mid-sized cities. So between 100,000, 250,000 population compared to one another, small towns compared to one another. And then the same thing for sheriff's departments compared to one another. Um, right yeah. No, that's cool. Um, I have gotten, I've gotten two different uh, texts um asking about your former organization uh we've agreed not to talk about uh ground zero because there's some legal issues right now um so i wanted to state that so folks are thinking i'm ignoring them like you didn't ask you know so yeah, um, i mean like you know i kind 
we didn't have like a lot of prep like going into to this this interview so right so i you know if we it, there there are legal legal issues like i but i'll just say that um you know, i think there are differences in strategy um differences in strategy differences in thinking about you know what our role should be as um not only data scientists but data scientists who have an eye towards really trying to make the world a better place and not just like talk about why the world's a bad place um and i think for me i've, I've been very focused on going where the data suggests the biggest impact can be um and doing so in a way that um i think is like transparent and and straightforward um so like if you know, for example, I, I share the data on low level arrests, right? So the places that reduce low level arrests the most, reduce police shootings the most. Those are the places that are moving in a direction consistent with organizers who are saying reduce the size and scope of the police state. That data should push us to push for those policies, right? And not to like keep pushing for things that maybe have not worked um, right. or that maybe are, maybe can, can work up to a certain threshold, but at some point, like there's a lot more work to do if the police are going to continue to make, let's say you change, um, so let's say you change a police department's policy around use of force, as an example. Right. Um, and you say like the police should not be able to choke people. Um, they should not be able to do uh, no knock raids, for example. Um, and you say, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to invest in that. That's going to be a big difference to change the world. Well, you're not. And the reason that you're not is because one, chokeholds represent fewer than 1% of the total number of people killed by the police. Two, no knock raids also represent uh, fewer than 1% of use of force incidents. So even if you ended both of those things tomorrow, you'd be at 98% of the current levels of police violence, assuming that the police didn't just use another technique instead of the chokehold to kill a person anyway. So more theory. Not game changer, right? Like even if we did it, it's not that it, it, it's not worth doing. It's not that police should be allowed to, to choke people. It's like, that's not what we're saying, but. Right. Um, so but, you're saying like, more practice and less theory. Yeah, we have an obligation to move the most impactful ideas and policies possible in this moment. We have like unprecedented energy and people in the streets trying to move things. Moment. So I think in that in that moment, I think that direction has to be one of removing police from a whole host of functions, creating alternatives, um, decriminalizing low-level uh, offenses, uh, ending low-level arrests, ending uh, jail incarceration for a whole host of things as like a step one. Um, those are like the direction we need to go in when you look at the data. And I, I wasn't getting that from, I think, the organization that I was a part of. It wasn't the direction that they, that, right that some people there wanted to move in. And you were a founding member of that organization, correct? That's correct. Uh, Co-founded Campaign Zero and and uh, I'm sorry, and, I said Ground Zero. I'm tripping. That's that, no that's the text. Listening to them, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I mean, uh, co-founder of Campaign Zero, one of four co-founders. Um, yeah, uh, right. still have a good relationship with most of the co-founders. Okay, most of the, the, the <laughs> probably the ones we like. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, another question they asked: um, Do you believe in community control of all forms of public safety? uh i mean yeah i mean the community should be in control uh, yeah i mean I, I mean maybe this is like a, a, a hidden question like i feel like yes the community should be in control of all forms of public safety um and in addition to that like i think that there are some some questions about like places where i'm just thinking out loud so you know but you know i think there are a lot of conservative areas where um when we say community control, like we have a particular idea, but their idea of community control is going to be really harmful for us. Um, so like there, we've got to figure out a solution for that. But I think in like black communities, like we should be in charge of whether there a police force even exists at all, let alone like what it looks like or what it does. Right. Um, and I don't think currently like that's, that's a, a real power that, that, that we've been able to, that we've been, that we've had, right. Like we, that has been something that the state has really imposed on us from the start. Um, even the funding streams, like even cities where they're trying to defund the police. Now you've got, like in Florida, um, you know, the state passed a law where the governor can veto, can overrule any decision to cut a police budget. Or in Texas, same thing happened. Austin, organized the Austin Justice Coalition. They got like a 30% cut in the budget approved in Austin. It was huge. It was like the largest anywhere. And then the state came in, they passed a law and they took that power away. So, so I believe in community control. I think 
there probably might be some things we need to work out when when the community is is very white and hostile. So we don't want to give them all the control. Um, and we certainly don't want to give like these like conservative governors the power to completely take away our ability to, to control our communities. Um, we're going to go to one more question and then we'll uh, uh, go from a uh, matter of fact, we have two questions. I'm sorry. We'll end it with two questions. If that's all right with you. First question is uh, what impact uh, the mayor's district attorney judge judges, police unions uh, have on the behavior of the police. So, um, you know, of all those groups, um, there are a lot of like really powerful positions in name only. So you've got, you know, people talk about the DA and the mayor and the police chief, and these are like the positions that are supposed to have the power. That's right. But really, like it's the police unions. Like we, we like in real, real talk, like the police unions. I mean, we saw what happened to De Blasio in New York City. Like the police union, right. the police turned their back on him. Like he he couldn't do. Like he was a mayor, yeah, but like the police union had the power there. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cities, the police unions have the power to override the police chief's decision. So like the police chief, let's say you have a police chief that's like, you know what, I'm going to fire this officer, even though like the police aren't happy about it. It's the right thing to do. I'm going to fire this officer. The police union can appeal that decision, get the officer reinstated very quickly right. um, in most right. cities. So right. so I think the police unions actually ha are the major like stakeholder in preventing progress from happening. Like the NRA is for, for gun safety, the police unions are like that powerful and that influential when it comes to policing. Right, yeah, the police union is like the mafia and the police are the actual hitmen, you know what I mean, to, to put it uh, to put it blunt. You know, they are the, the shoot, they are the, uh, you know, I mean, whenever there's a situation where uh, the police murder someone in the community, the first people you see online on the uh, news would be the police unions or police associations as representatives uh, defending the police, even if they don't have all the facts. So the police unions are the most, probably one of the most powerful organizations, if not the most powerful organization uh, in, in the civilian world. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, definitely the police unions, uh, uh, you know, they're the ones who, who, uh, you should most definitely have a, a problem with, you know. So um, um, we got one more question and we'll take it from there. Do you all track ShotSpotter? Uh, our organization does does not. Um, there are organizations that, that do. I know this, I think it's Cancel ShotSpotter is the, is the hashtag. There's been, I mean, they've been organized based in Chicago, I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, certainly like reach out to them. Um, you know, they, they're leading this work. I support them. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's not like within like our existing set of, of, uh, data programs, but I mean, certainly something that, that is a problem. And, you know, we've seen, you know, for example, Adam Toledo, when he was murdered by Chicago police, 13 years old, right. uh, it's because of shot spotter that, that, that were the, the reason that police were called into the situation. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a whole thing about police technologies and algorithms and like, we could get into that too, right? Like that, that's a whole additional field of work that, that is important. Hey, well, I definitely appreciate you coming on, especially short notice. Hopefully you'll come back on. We didn't, we weren't too rough on you. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I had a good uh, conversation. I appreciate it. No doubt. We appreciate you, man. Um, for the audience, I was behind the scenes getting ready. And I didn't realize my man popped up. I was trying to get my joint right. And he's looking like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? But anyway, um, <laughs> we're here now. Uh, definitely, again, uh, we appreciate you uh, coming on board. And uh, what are, uh, how can the, the, uh, the people support you? What are some ways that they can help to sustain? Because I know that this type of work, you know, um, unlike one of our uh, your, your, your former uh, allies, you know, I know that uh, your, your vest ain't blue enough. So I'm trying to find out how can you, uh, <laughs> how can we support what it is that you're doing? Yeah, um, so mappingpoliceviolence.us is the website. Um, there's a donate button uh, if you wanna contribute. You can also, if you wanna volunteer, help collect data, um, we'd be happy to work with you to do that. Um, you can reach out to me directly via email, uh, S-A-M-S-W-E-Y, number one, at uh, gmail.com and no happy 
Hey, man, stay on point. We'll be talking to you soon. Be safe out there. And, uh, you know, keep up that good work. It's necessary. As an organizer, it's always great to to have folks, uh, you know, on, on, on the right side of the fence because, you know, those numbers are, are absolutely impo- important. Uh, one of the other sites that we used to uh, go to was, I think, killedbypolice.net or killed by cops, something of that nature. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened to them, but um, definitely... You know. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole, uh, we can have a whole conversation about the sustainability of, of this work in the space because, I mean, killbypolice.net used to be, like, they used to be collecting a lot of data around this. They no longer exist. Fatal Encounters yeah. um, hasn't updated theirs uh, in the past seven months. Um, I mean, Washington Post last, I mean, this year was undercounting by, like, hundreds of cases. You had to send them oh, a yeah. list of Definitely. cases to include. Yeah. So, like, this is... a like a tenuous space like it's not impossible for there to be no data in the space yet again um without like real intentional support to sustain this space to sustain the people doing it um and not to like take away their platforms and stuff yeah no doubt because yeah because <laughs> we, we, we're gonna come back and talk about uh blue lights and blue vests uh, one of these days <laughs> when, when, when y'all get your legal things in order i know, I know you want to have a conversation one of these days one of these days you know i do i'm trying to play fair right now but um, I've said, I've said what 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 um what needs to be said at, at the moment. But you know, I'm, no doubt, I'm trying to be transparent. You know, I'm nah, not, and that, that's cool, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nah, that's cool, man. That's um, you know, we 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 definitely uh, you know, I mean, it, it it's all necessary, and and I'm glad that you came on because what happens is folks will lump you in the same bag because you roll with certain folks. You understand what I'm saying? So automatically, you know, uh. You know, of course, people was, you know, I mean, some folks came on today because they like, OK, Kalanji about to clap him. But, you know, I'm like, you know, he, he he's coming on even after everything. So let me get a man a fair, uh, you know, a, a fair convo and roll from there. Uh, Franny French said we need a, a part two to this convo. I don't yeah. know. Can we get him to commit on air for a part two? I'm down. Yep. Let's do it. All right. Don't, don't make us look. I'm going to talk about you if you don't come through and I call you. But anyway, <laughs> keep up the good work, man. I'm going to talk to you soon, bro. Cool. Thank you. No doubt. You're checking out Riot Starter TV. That was Samuel Sinegue. And, um, you know, we appreciate you all for supporting what we're doing. Man, I know y'all, y'all I hear y'all in the background talking about I'm trying to be messy. I ain't trying to be messy. I'm just trying to be the Riot Starter that I am. Y'all like it like that. That's why you're here. But anyway, um, definitely we support. We uh, appreciate your support. We appreciate you all supporting our platform, Black Power Media. Um, I don't know, man. Y'all ready for some more riot starters, or should I keep it at like once a month? Let me know. You know what I mean? I, you know that that last joint I did with uh, uh, with Mock Mood, I thought that was gonna go through the roof. And I don't know, man. I don't think everybody saw that. I think it's kind of necessary for you to go out and check the last piece we did with my mood uh Rauf. not everybody can come up with uh with nba players and and hip-hop artists and stuff like that you know but but we need to uh we need to continue to support um we're gonna be taking riot starter tv uh a tad bit further we have some other things in the works coming in the fall uh not just on this platform but we're expanding uh across the board so make sure you uh you know follow the movement um i'm on twitter my joint right there on the joint right there at kalanji changa stay tuned because we have some huge announcements coming up we appreciate you um and you know stay on point and check out our site thepeoplesarmy.org thepeoplesarmy.org because um you know we need streets for real and we need our people to uh support our efforts anyway be safe out there black august resistance long live the dragon and uh, we're seeing a few ticks. Stay on point. Riot Starter TV. You know what we do around here. If you don't know, you'll learn soon. Anyway, be safe. We out.